Amen. Isn't that good news? Uh, Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 38. Uh, while you're turning there, the man that I mentioned for prayer earlier, Mr. Donald Beard, uh, his daughter texts me and he's in some renal failure, so uh, he definitely needs our prayers. Isaiah 38, beginning in the very first verse. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is, which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go, thy way, go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, and I have seen thy tears, and behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your presence this morning. We praise you, uh, Lord, when uh, you fill your house and you uh, minister to your people. Lord God, we pray that you would do that this morning, that you'd manifest yourself in a great and mighty way, Lord, that you uh, might save someone that's uh, uh, need is, in need of salvation this morning. And we pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture I'll be preaching this morning on the thought you're going to die. And that's not real pleasant preaching, uh, but I have news for you, you're going to die. If the Lord doesn't uh, return uh, in your lifetime, uh, you will wind this thing up and you will die. And what I have found with people dying in, uh, in health care, everybody's okay with it until it's them. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, you know, mama's lived a good life and, and we'll just let her go. But what about when it comes to you? And, and that, that, that is the difference that I see. Uh, the Bible says in those that days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came and said unto him, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now, uh, it would be a misrepresentation, and it would, be, it would be the wrong thing for a preacher to tell you that everything is okay and don't worry about death. Uh, you know, uh, I heard this uh, Southern Gospel song a few years ago, uh, and, and, and it was, uh, death ain't no big deal. Yeah. Well, it's a big deal to me. Uh, I'm a saved and on my way to glory, but death is still a big deal. And when you see someone in agony when they're dying, it is a big deal. Yeah. And, and, and we need to realize and know that uh, we're facing that. Yeah, sure. The redeemed and the lost alike, we're facing death. And every day that we live, we just draw a little closer to it. Amen. That's part. Uh, that's part of this life, and and the only way really uh, escaping death is it this, and that's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, I want you to see that Hezekiah's reaction. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed and said unto the Lord. Now. Hezekiah wasn't a lost person in, in, in Old Testament times. He was saved as much as any individual could be because the sacrifice had not been offered. Hezekiah was a man that believed God. You know what I found through all the Old Testament? That it's just like us, believing God was the key to redemption. Because even before the law existed, uh, it said that Noah believed God. And it says of Abraham that he believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Right. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, even though we believed in God, you can follow the life of Hezekiah before his death. And he served God 
but he still feared death. Mm -hmm. Because he, you know what? He turned toward the, his face toward the wall and began to pray. Began, began to see God's face. Began to uh, desire that he might hear from him and he might, and he might gain something from the truth that he gives. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beg thee, or I beseech thee, how I walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart. Now, as he's beginning to pray, you know, uh, like most people that get, get a death sentence, uh, they begin to think about what their life has been about. And he, sa and he says very clearly, I I've walked before thee with a perfect heart. Now, that doesn't mean he was sinless perfection, but he walked before him complete. Uh, he understood the law enough to follow him in an unusual way. And, and you know what? That's why we need to study the Word of God and we need to know where, where the script, what the Scriptures really teach because people are going to before, come before you with a falsehood. Yeah. Um, because you know the Bible does say this, uh, to be baptized for regeneration. It, it does say that. But it's out of context. And, and, and you need to understand uh, what the Bible says and where it says it. And, and, and so we see what Hezekiah does is he begins to remember his life. And I advise you this morning to remember your life. Even you young people, we're, we're outnumbered by the young ones this morning. But you know what? You need to remember your life. If it's 20, 25, or 30 years, you need to look at your life very, very carefully. Because, listen, you don't know how much time you've got. Right. You know, if we were just doing it numerically, uh, we'd say, well, Brother Junior's the first one to go. Well, you don't know that. That's right. uh, uh, I, I may go 10 years before he does. And, and, and we, got, we got to live in that safety thinking that we've got all the time we need. Yeah, right. But the truth is you don't. You just don't know what another day will bring. And so as Hezekiah, even though a redeemed person, even though a person that knew the Lord, death scared him. Then Hezekiah turned toward the, law, uh, the wall and prayed and said unto the Lord, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beg you, I beseech you, how I walked before thee, in truth and with a perfect heart. So when you think about your life, can you say either one of those? Hmm. You know, uh, this is the problem this morning. Grace has been surrounding the ground by Armenians that you can live like a dog and be redeemed. Amen. Right. But see, the, the Bible doesn't teach that. Right. Amen. The Bible says bring forth meat for repentance or evidence or, or, or something that shows your redemption. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith. Against, there such, against such there is no law. So if you, whatever you're trusting for redemption this morning, if it didn't bring forth good works, probably you're still lost. That's right, amen. And, and, and you know, uh, that, that may seem harsh, but the way that Hezekiah identified with God is what he had done. And so he brought that up into the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Now, I want you to see that it didn't come right back to Hezekiah, but it came to God's man. And he says, Return to Hezekiah. Tell him I've heard your prayer and that 15 years has been added. Hmm. Now, that, that's a good thing, ain't it? Uh, that's a merciful God. But you be careful what you pray for. That's right. Because in that 15 years, Rehoboam was born hmm. and was the worst ungodly, filthy king in the whole history of Israel. Uh, and that's where we're acting in the permissive will of God. Uh, you know, the most dangerous point, if you're redeemed, is getting out there in the permissive will of God 
and he will work you over or work someone else over to get you back in the perfect will of God. And that's what we need. So as Hezekiah is approaching death, even though he was a godly man, he began to think about things a lot differently. And when you look at death face to face, you will look at things a great deal differently. Now you can, you can think about someone near unto you that's died and you can tell that they looked at things differently. My sister died at 44 uh, from breast cancer. And she would kind of go back and forth. When, and, and she was a nurse too, so she, she uh, I mean, they sentenced her to death. She knew what it was as soon as they were telling her. And, 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 and at first she said, well, Larry, there's nothing I can do but stay comfortable. And I said, you're right. And then a couple of weeks later, Larry, I want chemotherapy. Well, we'll make it happen. And the reason why, see, she was looking death eyeball to eyeball. And it's easy to say when you're a nurse, well, this is it. But when you get it, hey, this is it for me, you begin to look at it a lot differently. And, and so, you know what? We need to look at it this morning. This is it for me. If you can imagine that and you can think about that, this is it for me. I am dying and there's no intervention separate and apart the goodness of God. I'm dying because you know what? Newsflash, you are. Amen. Without the intervention of God, you're good as dead. Yep. And, and so we, we as the Lord's people sometimes... Our, our service or our desires and what makes us tick and what makes us want things is really based on longevity. Uh, longevity in nursing is what we call about the distance of life. And someone that's healthy supposedly has more longevity than someone that smoked three packs their whole life, three packs a day their whole life. But again, what I've seen is you just don't know. I had a patient over, uh, over close to Bumpus Mills when I did home health. He smoked three packs a day, and when I took care of him, he was 98. <laughs> and you know, you can just say, well, that's the goodness of God. That's right. That's just the goodness of God. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we need to realize that our life is fragile and our death sentence may come at any time. And, and, and that is a reality that we have to deal with. Go with me to the Gospel of John. Uh, uh, Brother Junior mentioned that this morning. I thought he was going to get in on my sermon. But the Gospel of John, now, as I give you some bad news this morning and give you a little hardship, something that's kind of hard and not palatable, listen, the good news is this, there's someone that's made victory over death. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has put death aside. Now, listen, you will have to walk those waters. If God doesn't come back and He doesn't return, you're facing death, but there's victory on the other side. Now, the, the horribleness of this is what if death continues? Hmm. Yeah. Because for the lost person, that's where you're at. Uh, yeah. Just constant torment. Hmm. And have you ever thought about Lazarus? Every sense he had was still intact. True. Remember he says, uh, and he looked across there and, said, and he saw Abraham and Lazarus. His vision was intact. He, he looked that way and said, there they are. Yep. And, and you know, to, to, to believe that too, and I do, he had to see the beauty of Abraham's bosom. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what Abraham's bosom looked like. There's really not a lot of scripture about it except to say that it's there or was there. But you know what? It had to be a beautiful place. It had to be a place of contentment, a place that you could enjoy. And, and he could see that. And he could still talk. He still felt... 
Uh, and, and I'll give up Diet, Co Diet Dr. Peppers the first of the year. And actually, I'm more thirsty drinking water than I have anything else. And I just keep drinking it and keep, keep drinking it. And he, he had that sensation, hey, I'm thirsty. I, I'm experiencing thirst. So that's another sense that we knew that was intact. And he said, I'm tormented. Um, you know, it's bad enough to be on fire and bad enough to be thirsty, but could you just be tormented constantly? Mm. You, you know what a lot of times torments most people is their memory. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of times about, a thing, about things I wish I'd never seen and wish I'd never done. Yeah. Amen. And that's torment. Mm -hmm. and, and so we find that that the rich man had all this intact and, and all of it was in place, but yet he was in the very hell that now exists. Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house, and then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now, I want you to see the first thing about Martha is that a lot of times she believed God more than the average person. Everybody gets down on Martha, but you know, uh, Mar Martha had an interest in serving God. She really did. That's why she cleaned her house so good and why she was always fixing uh, a meal for the, for the apostles is because she had an interest in serving God. So don't get down on Martha. And here we understand, listen, she believed in the power of Jesus over death. She says, if you'd have been here, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, you know, and again, you, you remember this in the Gospel of John, I believe it is, uh, after the resurrection. Jesus made this statement, if I will, and I think he's talking about Peter, he'll live forever. But then it cl clarifies, if I will. See, it wasn't his will for that to happen. But if he proposed that and he had willed it to, it would have. So we find that, that Christ, first of all, is, is victorious and above death. And you know what? Uh, understanding that is important. Martha understood that. We live in a day and age which I don't believe we give God the credit. We don't give Jesus the credit to being over death. But He is. He, he, he is above death in every way. And the spirit man that's truly been regenerate, they, are, they have trusted his ability to be above death. Now, if you will, uh, continue with me in verse 22. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Now, here, Martha makes a statement that she really doesn't believe. Because we'll see in a minute, she, she begins to clarify some things. But if you ever thought and really believed that God can do anything, do, do you really believe that? Um, I think the older I get, the more I believe it, but, but the, you know, it, it's hard to get a hold of it. What about Donna's Uncle David out here? Do you believe that he could come forth? God says so, yes. Right? David's been dead over a year. But I believe it. I, you know what? And if it happened, I wouldn't understand it. But I believe it. Uh, you're, you're talking about someone that has literally done compressions on a dying person and, and, and be gone uh, to the point they're cold. And in my, in my nursing mind saying, man, this is impossible, they're gone. But God can do it. See, that, that's the opposite of what mankind believes, is it not? Is it not even the very opposite 
that science teaches us? Yes, it is. Because uh, science will teach you after so long, there's no hope, there's nothing left to do. There's the, it's done, and Martha says, hey, I believe that. But she, did she do it in application? Did she believe it in applying it? Verse 23, Jesus said unto her, uh, thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever, shall, and whosoever liveth and believeth me shall not die. Believest thou this? Now, that's a, that's a good question. Do you believe that this morning? Do you really believe that Christ has victory over death? Because Martha thought she believed it, but she really didn't. See, there's a lot of people that, that are in, in, in that situation this morning. They think they believe it. But, you, know, you know, that's the problem with that old logic, salvation. You know what the, the, this illustrates? It. Our logic is just as corrupt as the rest of us. Because my logic, four years of nursing school tells me after 30 minutes, there's no hope. That if you get them back, they'll be a vegetable. But spiritual knowledge says, hey, I'm the resurrection. It don't matter how long they've been dead. And we as the Lord's people, we need to understand that, that victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how corrupt you've been, it doesn't matter how sinful you've been, if you're genuinely regenerate, you're saved. It, you know what? And, and when I say this, and I think Sister Sarah could uh, attest to this this morning, it doesn't she, she was saved right up here while she was playing in the piano. Uh, she didn't invite Jesus into her heart. That's foolish. There's no Bible for that. What happened is the Lord came by and, and spoke life to her and she was saved. Amen. And listen, if you don't have anything to compare to that, you're probably still lost. Because uh, you go through that book, you include the Old Testament, and New Testament both, and you'll never ever hear of a sinner's prayer. And you know why? Because it's not there. Amen. That's right. It's just not there. Nope. And, and, you, and, and you know who came up with it? A bunch of people that, that doubted the ability of God. Hmm. Hmm. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know because He is mighty and because He's on the throne, whatever He wants, it's going to happen. Verse 27, Then she saith unto Him, Yea, Lord, I believe that Thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, uh, secretly and said, The Master's come and calleth for thee. Now, uh, Mary comes along and she makes this statement. I know, I know that he will, he will live in the resurrection of the last day. See, and, and, and in our minds, we'll just say David again. If he was regenerate, we know. We know that he'll live. And you know what? That, that's a good assurance. But what if he spoke it today? Do you believe that? that? That's a little bit more difficult, ain't it? And you know why? Because everything about our flesh says no, no, no. And you know what? You're really believing that death has the victory and Christ doesn't. Right? But, but, but praise be to God, you know, Lazarus was in there for three days and all he had to say was, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says he came out hand and bound, hand and foot and giving praise to God. Now that, that's the God we serve. And this morning, if you're lost, uh, this is the news flash for you. You're bound hand and foot and seen. You're captured by 
you're captured by the very prince of darkness. And the truth is, you came into this world just that way. And, and, and if, if Christ doesn't intervene, you, you'll, li you'll live that way and you'll die that way. You know, uh, Brother Junior made allusions to uh, people that will stand before Christ in the last day and said, did I not prophesy in thy name or did I not preach in your name? And you know what? They really believe that. Go to 1 Timothy this week. He said, I, meaning Christ, I will send them strong That's delusions right. Right. that they will believe a lot. That's right. Amen. So you know what? You may be deluded. Mm -hmm. You may be confused. You, 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 you may not have this thing by the tail like you think it you do. Amen. So, do you know Christ or do you not? And, and this is what I have found. A real salvation will always end in good works. And a fake never does. You, you know why people quit attending church most of the time? They've never been saved anyway. You know what? If for whatever reason, just say the Lord led me, led me away from the New Testament, I wouldn't quit going to church. I'd find a church somewhere that stood for truth and me and Donna and the girls would land there and continue to try to serve the Lord. You know why? Not because we're so great, because we're redeemed. Me and Donna have been saved. And what we desire is to serve the Lord. And if it's mopping the floor or preaching the gospel, I'm fine with doing either. Amen. And that's the result of redemption. Anything less, I would be scared of. Anything less than, than creating you, uh, in you, a, a drive to serve Christ would be... Would be uh, something that I don't think matches to redemption. Now, I will say, uh, and I know you all, all know this, shortest verse in the Bible. As they were having this dialogue of her and, I mean, Christ and Mary, yeah. he says, uh, the Bible says, Jesus wept. Now, do you think he was grieving? That's foolish. Because the Bible says this. He, on the way down there, he said plainly to the, uh, and, and he was trying to speak to them in a spiritual sense, and they couldn't get it. So the Bible says he, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Right? So he wasn't grieving over his buddy Lazarus dying. Two of his best female disciples still didn't get it. That's what he was grieving for. Yeah. And you know what? I think that sometimes we live a lifetime and we just don't get it. Amen. We just don't get it. That's why Hebrews 10.25 says there's a appointed man wants to die. Right. And after that, judgment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know what? When you get to that appointment, nothing is going to stop. If you had a team of physicians around you, you're still going to die. Right. Those of us that went to Bumpus Mills, we remember Rose Scholler. At the end, I think Rose had 12 physicians in the room. And they were doing everything they could. And you know what? Rose still died. And the reason why, she had reached her point in time. That's right. And, and you know, this is the joy about that. I guess about a year and a half before that, she came up with this. Listen, I've been deceived. I'm not saved, but I want to be. And the Lord saved her. And then at 41, she had her only child and died a week later. So you see, you, you, you see that is a reality that the Lord God uh, gave to Rose before she went out into eternity. And, and, and that's a rich blessing. Amen. Uh, I, I think going from the point that you're deceived to redemption right. is almost, of course, nothing's difficult with God, but at least in this little finite mind, it's more difficult than being the county drunk. 
and going to redemption. Yeah. It shouldn't be that way. It is the same, but at least in man's eye, yeah. you're like, you know, uh, Rose literally went to church her whole life, but no redemption, no nearness unto Christ. And, and we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that uh, that <laughs> salvation is a lot more than just being a good Baptist. Go me to the book of Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and uh, verse 36. Acts 9 and verse 36. The Bible says, which God, which the work, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. Now, I want you to see a characteristic that will follow the redeemed is peace. <coughs> and when you don't have that inward peace, something is wrong. Something is not right in your life. Um, Verse 37, that word I say you, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began with Galilee uh, from the baptism which John preached, now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil and God was with him. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, I want you to see uh, the element of the Holy Ghost. Now, I really believe we live in a day where the Holy Ghost has been so minimized by Baptists. And I don't know if it's the fear of the Pentecostals or what. But I'll, I'll say this. If you don't know the Holy Ghost, you don't know Christ either. Amen. Because he is, the Holy Ghost is the revealer of truth. And you know why? It's not Christ. Christ is the That's right hand of the Father. Amen. Right? Amen. He's making intercession for us. But what, you remember in the Lord's 40 day ministry after the resurrection and before his ascension, he, he makes this promise. He said, I will send you a comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And, and, he, and he did that. And, and so what, what we need uh, among God's people are two things. Listening to the Holy Ghost and Holy Ghost condemnation. Just being condemned. Understood that you're a lost, unregenerate, unregenerate sinner by the Holy Ghost. Because you know what? In reality, He's the only one that could reveal that thing anyway, right? Because it's a spiritual truth. You remember when Paul was writing, I think it was to the church uh, at Thessalonica maybe, or, Ephe or Ephesus, and he, he says, these things are spiritually discerned. Right. You know what? So that means you can't get them up here. You know, the, the, just the fact that you need to be redeemed is a spiritual thing, and you can't get it just from logic. Amen. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we, we need to embrace this and understand the role of the Holy Ghost in redemption. Verse 39, and we are witnesses of all the things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God had raised up the third day and shewed him openly. So we find another thing that's victorious over death. Christ is victorious over death. And God the Father is victorious over death. And, uh, you know, they were just as much skeptical about that. And that's why the angelic beings had to say, come and see the place where the Lord lay. Because they did not believe it. See, we, the, the, those things we need to understand and know. You know what? When you think about death, knowing that your Savior is victor above it is a wonderful thing. Knowing that the very God that you serve is above it is a wonderful thing. Now, I want you to listen. If you don't know either one, and to know one is to know the other, 
your sentence unto death. Uh, you're as good as in hell. But without the intervention of God and not the intervention of yourself. Uh, we're going to take Sarah down to the, to the Julian church and, and a bit and baptize her. Has nothing whatever to do with her redemption. It's a good testimony and I, I think that's what she, why she's doing it. But it, it has nothing to do with redemption. And, and you know, and the older I get, I see this. I don't think it has that much to do with church membership. <laughs> I think it's just a testimony. Yeah, that's right. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we need to understand and know that we have two people, two individuals, two entities that have said, hey, I'm bigger than death. In fact, if you, think, if you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, Lazarus wasn't the only one. He raised another girl from the dead, and they was on the way to the cemetery with the widow's son, and he said, hang on. And he touched him, and he lived again. <laughs> See, that's, that's where we need to be, on the belief so sense, simple that everything, whatever, is under Christ's feet. Yeah. You know, I about give up on looking at politics. Because listen, we're in a mess. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get worse. Uh, there was a, a second representative elected, and she is the Muslim of the Muslim faith. And you know, it, it, my skin kind of crawls when I, when I hear that. But what we need to pray for is that lady's redemption. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's hard to do. But in her acceptance speech, she called our president the most foul name you could think of. In her acceptance speech, Listen, we're in trouble. Don't you think for a moment this nation is going to last? Don't you think? You know what? I'm 50 years old now, and, and this could all fall apart easily in the next five years. And then are what we're going to do? Well, I'll, I'll do what I've done up to now. Just trust Christ. Amen. That's right. And, and, and you think, well, everything will be fine. No, no. You know what? If... If they say them greenbacks you got is worth nothing, you know what they're worth? Nothing. Yeah. And, and, and so we as Lord's people, we need to, we need to understand and know that, that our Savior has had victory over death in every sense of the word. He's stronger. He, he's much, much stronger than that. Now I want to go to the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, and I want to read verse 13. Hebrews 11 and verse 13. These all died. <laughs> and he, he, he names the whole hall of faith. Abraham, Abraham Isaac, Jacob. Uh, he even uh, names the harlot. That sent, all she did was trust God. In fact, when the soldier said, if you'll just put us up this time and hang a little red thread in your window, you're going to be spared. Rahab the harlot. Can you imagine the goodness of God that Rahab the harlot is mentioned in the hall of faith? Amen. <laughs> that shows what God can do, does it not? Mm -hmm. And she never did anything extraordinary, at least in man's eyes, but trust the truth of the Word of God. Them boys, them, uh, them uh, Israelites said it, and she believed it. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people uh, need to appreciate the, the, uh, the fullness uh, of real faith in Christ. But I want you to see, despite that, despite all these wonderful people that, that served God, these all died. And listen, this morning... You're going to die too. You're going to die with Christ or you're going to die without Christ. But you are going to die. And, and that's why, you know what? Even as a redeemed person, I always claim this truth in, in 1 Peter. Make your calling and election sure. 
And listen, I, I will say this because listen, until the Lord saves you, you won't understand much about election. Right. But you'll understand about your calling. And if the calling's not there, I mean the effectual call of grace, you're still lost. That's right. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know uh, the difference between true salvation and a faith because this death is coming. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but have seen, have seen them afar off. Now, uh, you know, a, a, real, a real Jewish person, they knew what they were doing wasn't adequate. But they knew that, that salvation was coming. Even from the very first sin in the Garden of Eden, blood was the only atonement. You know how they got close? Something had to die. I don't know what it was. And, you know, you'll hear these little, these little figures and stuff, pictures, that it's a lamb. It may well have been a lamb. I don't know. It may have been a lion. But I know something had to die to cover their sin. And just the next generation, we find, uh, we, we find their sons out there and one of them given the appropriate sacrifice, Cain and Abel, Abel given the blood, and Cain given something that he conjured up himself. Do you know what Cain's sacrifice was? Man-made religion. That's right. Yep. Just man-made religion. And you know what? He died in that condition. And I also want you to know this, that God banished him to the land of Nod. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't mom and daddy, it was God. And that was even further from God. Mm. He married into them heathens, and that's all you ever hear about him. See, I ask you this, and thank God we're not under sacrifice, but every Sunday you bring something here. You either bring a willing heart or you bring a rebellious heart. Right. You, you bring an interest in the things of God or you come with no interest at all. <laughs> See, that, 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 that's the indicator of if you're redeemed or if you're lost. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we need to understand and know it's just because of the goodness of God and grace that He saved us. The rest of that verse says this, and were, purchased, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now I want to give you two things. Strangers and pilgrims. First of all, when someone meets with you, can they leave you saying, man, he was strange? <laughs> because they ought to be able to. Mm -hmm. Because if you fit in, something's wrong. Yep. You have a spiritual issue. Yep. Uh, strangers, uh, you don't belong. See, redeemed people don't belong, and that's why we long for heaven. Mm -hmm. So he says, you're pilgrims and strangers. Uh, you know what? A pilgrim never finds a home. And, you know, the, the old hymn, this world is not my home. Can, can you claim that this morning? Because, see, the redeemed ought to be so. Um, you know, we... Uh, me and Donna have that little place over there. We, we've lived over 20 years now. And I call it home, but it really isn't. Uh, it, it's a nice place to stay. Uh, my mama used to say, you get in and out of weather. But it's not home. And that's how we should feel. So as you're facing death, and I've had a lot of patience recently. And I think this may be why I have a little bit of understanding. You know, when you, when you admit someone to any healthcare facility in the United States, this is required now. Hospital, nursing home, wherever. You have to fill out this form 
if you want to be resuscitated or not. And there's resuscitation, full treatment of illness, partial treatment of illness, comfort measures only, and then if you want a feeding tube to sustain your life. Now, at the beginning, what I've seen is everybody's like, no CPR, no intervention, blah, blah, blah. But when death is coming, they change their mind. They, they, they start marking that full resuscitation. And you know why? They're facing death in its reality. And, you know, it's easy to say right now, and, and, and my wife knows what I want in the event of a big problem. But you know what? In the end, I might say, wait a minute, Donna, I've changed my mind. Because death is a reality. And we need to look at it. Yep. We, and, and, and we need to see if we're really prepared mm. or if we're not. Mm. Because it's only, it's only that way. Either you're ready or either you're not. And that's where we need to be.